It's me, Vera, here to remind you that this is an adult podcast. That means we're going to deal with tough topics. Take a break if you need it, and be kind to yourself, because we sure won't be. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to season two of Crack Crown, episode nine, correct? I believe so. Correct. Hey, yeah, we love it. Uh, As always, I am your storyteller, Mike Martin, joined by three of my wonderful players, Dot, Jason, and Josh. Hello. Hi, Max. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Robert. It's good to see you. We had a little bit of a duo episode last week, which uh, two of the three of you were not privy to, but uh, it was a nice episode for the first time in a long time. The, the coterie or pieces of the coterie at least have gotten a reward and not just been kept on the ground beaten with a boot over and yeah. over again you got to check out the blackstone hotel if you're curious what it looks like and the opulence of it all uh please head back to the last episode and check it out actually i also posted pictures as promised in the discord of the actual hotel so you can go check those out Ooh, fantastic it's pretty it is a gorgeous hotel it's going to be an interesting place for your k- kindred to kind of because it's going to be turn- well, we'll talk about it in the game i don't want to get ahead of myself <laughs> before we jump into the game which i'm clearly eager to do uh let's go ahead and shill real quick thank you guys so much for watching the show listening to the show the best way to support us is just to keep listening share the show with your friends who are interested in tabletop rpgs or maybe haven't and you want to get them into it also you can go ahead and uh, just support us directly at patreon.com slash pod by night by uh there depending on what tier you jump into you can get extras like after shows audio and video also if you want to support us beyond the uh going above and beyond you just want to join the community our discord is a great place to do that it's totally free uh usually a link somewhere in the description or over on our twitter um or x or whatever the fuck you call it at this point also head over to our youtube channel something i never talk about if you have it over to youtube.com slash pod by night Uh, Obviously, all of our episodes go live there, but uh, we had a couple special episodes go up over there for a two episode fallout game that we did on our stream at twitch.tv slash pod by night. So uh, if you want to see us do some other stuff, go check that out. If you want to see Mathis get to roll dice, what? not as an ST. Yes, I am not running the game. I get to play. I know. Mathis got to play. You're not allowed to play. <laughs> Dot, I, listen, Dot is an amazing GM and fuck, she part, she like wrote. I did write the, the thanks, campaign Mathis. we were running. Like she was, uh, which is, which was awesome. So please go check that out. And the fallout campaign, like the fallout rule system. Uh, is really good. I really enjoy it. It's kind of similar. It's got some similarities to a vampire, actually. Yeah, it's just a lot more shared things, I think, than vampire because everything's individual. But it does have a lot of the same dice pool me- machinations. Cool. All right. Well, uh, with that all in mind, if we are all good, let's go ahead and set the scene, rein things in, and see what our coterie is up to. As Vera has been sitting on the outside, or should I say standing on the outside of the now newly acquired hotel that you and Duke recently received the paperwork of, Duke was pulled away. He had actual legal legal papers to sign, shell companies to make sure have the right uh, stake in the hotel and all the other tax nonsense that you know Duke is rather good for. It is how he weaseled his way into your life, after all. And as you've been waiting, you know that at least part of your coterie is on their way to the hotel after having gotten the all clear from you and Duke. The one that will be lingering behind will be the one that is still rather injured, Max, as he sits in a safe, if not devoid of any personality, basement in a rather empty semi-office, semi-apartment building. And he heals that little bit of aggravated damage that still lingers. And as you sit outside, the night that was once rather clear and chill has a small speckle of rain begin to trickle down and hit the dry pavement that uh, pedestrians walk. A few people hurry under a a couple of the uh, overhangings of different buildings. Others have umbrellas on them, clearly prepared for what they uh, looked into as the weather. And as all that chaos amongst the civilians begins as rain begins to pull in, so do you see the uh, very simple black vehicle roll up in park <clears throat> as john sits in the driver's seat as always though as he throws it into park he steps out of the car and steps to the back passenger door and opens it opens it for robert 
as you stand out, as you step out, you see Vera. Vera, what are you dressed in again? Uh, I apologize. I can't quite remember. Let's be real. When have I had a chance to change clothes? I'm probably still wearing the same damp dress from that horrible boat incident. <laughs> yeah, it's been only a couple nights. Uh, because if I had a chance to yeah, change, it would have been whatever Lyle could dig out of my closet of stuff that was left behind when we went to Gary. Um, so I don't probably look my freshest. Uh, not yet this evening. And Robert, as you step out, and, uh, well, should I say first, um, Josh, he doesn't open the door for you. Sean waits for it anyway. Yeah, I figured <laughs> Josh, uh, uh, Sean wouldn't wait for it. But as the two of you step out of the vehicle, as the rumble of the engine just sits idly, mm. before you, you see the grand uh, Port Cocher of the Blackstone Hotel. You're greeted with a wave of warm air, thick with the scent of jasmine and polished wood as the double doors swing open and you're bold on the in- uh, and you're walked on the inside with Vera by your side. The hotel itself is uh, a testament to Chicago's architectural heritage, a majestic bow arts building that seems to rise from the sidewalk with an air of quiet grandeur. Moonlight glints off the immaculated, cleaned limestone facade, highlighting the intricate details of the French Renaissance design. And even at the very top, something maybe Vera didn't notice before as you were swept in. You actually do see, uh, rather high up, ornate gargoyles that peer down from the rooftop. Mm. Silent, you know, stone guardians from an old era past. And as you step into the entrance, the doorman opens it with his crisp uniform and offering his practiced welcome smile. And he holds open the heavy bronze doors for the three of you as you step inside. Welcome home, boys. Uh, does, does Vera do like a uh, grand like sweep? Is she very... Um, uh, there's probably a grand arm gesture, at least. Very proud. <laughs> I would expect nothing less. Yeah, finally somewhere benefiting our station, don't you think? Quite. Well, I'm glad you like it, Sean. Yeah, it's proper swanky. It is rather uh, kind of crazy beautiful in this place. You, you've never, uh, Sean in particular, um, Vera and Robert, different story. Sean, you've never spent more than maybe five minutes in a place this nice before someone's thrown you out. <laughs> yeah. Being you, essentially. Yeah, uh, but much. this time, you're actually able to uh, really take it in. And Vera, as you step in, you notice that the uh, crystal swans are already gone. So much better. Vera, is there anything you want to do with the two of them? As in, do you want to, are you looking to walk around? Uh, The Castellan went off with Duke to take care of business. There are still employees around, but it's not very busy. This is a very expensive hotel. And something I maybe should have just told to uh, Robert and Sean is uh, even on the outside, it's not like a garbage piece of the city. It's like a highly maintained, high income, gorgeous historical part of Chicago, not the trash like areas that you've been living in forever. And then Gary, Indiana of all places. Mm -hmm. No, this is exceptionally gorgeous uh, inside and out. Sean, how much money do you think they shovel into this place daily to keep it so pristine? At least five pounds. Wait, we're in America. Five (laughs) dollars. Uh, this might sound a little familiar to Vera, but to give you guys a description of the inside, you're looking at a lobby that is like a symphony of opulence, right? The uh, the moonlight actually streams through stained glass uh, window dome at the very top. It casts colorful patterns across a polished marble floor. Crystal chandeliers twinkle high overhead, their prismatic light reflecting off the gleaming gold accents throughout this entire space. Lush potted palms and vibrant floral arrangements add a touch of nature to this man-made grandeur, while plush armchairs and deep sofas promise inviting pockets of conversation and relaxation. The air is low with a very small hum of activity, soft chatter, the clinking of glasses from the bar a little bit of a distance off, and over to your right-hand side, two large, uh, two more large blast doors, uh, brass doors with golden handles lead into a ballroom that is not being used at the moment. This place is beautiful. And as you walk up to the very top, you see the concierge 
uh, is, is, of course, sitting behind the desk and gives you another warm smile, Vera, but a quiet nod, knowing that he doesn't need to let you know, like, he's here for you if he's already uh, introduced himself prior. Um, again, the Castellan is not around. She's off uh, doing her own thing. Well, I would introduce you both to the Castellan, but her and Duke had to finish paperwork, if you know what I mean. So what would you like to see first? As that question lingers, the concierge on the other side actually leans in and says, uh, ma'am, not to eavesdrop or interrupt, but perhaps the two, the three of you would like to see where those of your stature reside when their evenings come to a close. Ah, oh, yes, personal quarters. That might be lovely. Can you send someone secure? He nods and he goes, it'll be just a moment, madam. And he heads over to a small uh, uh, phone that's under the desk. You see him lifted. He presses a button and he goes, ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, just one. Please. Yeah. Virgil. Yeah. Okay. Make you hear click. Virgil will be here in a couple of minutes. Ignoring the FedEx Kinkos, which is going to be redone, and this piece here, and I'm kind of talking while we wait for whoever to come pick us up. It, it, the, the, the FedEx Kinkos sticks out. It, any hotel with uh, the kind of uh, clientele that the Blackstone has usually has like some sort of mailing service for the businesses and whatnot. It just always sticks out, and especially in a historical hotel like this, this FedEx Kinkos looks so out of place. As you describe it, you wait maybe a three or four minutes before eventually you see a tall, lean uh, gentleman. Wait, wait, I need to send a package. To who? <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. Oh, I did learn how to use a copy machine. Well, after Sean said he thought $5 a day is all the cost to maintain this wonderful place, I just thought I would jump in on the terrible humor. Let me let you in on a little secret as someone that has dealt with him for a few decades now. Sean does everything in his capability to assure that his words dig under your skin like little grains of sand because the fact of the matter is he's extremely intelligent and doesn't want anybody to know. Hey, hold up. My secrets are not for public display, okay? And I, I'm going around with the two torridors in one of the most beautiful places I've ever been allowed in. So allow me just a little bit of fun. Yeah? But Sean, truly, if you'd like to see the numbers, I imagine Duke would be giddy at the idea. Considering the fact that I signed paperwork tonight to leave this to you if something happens to he and I. Maybe that catches ja, uh, Sean off guard. You what now? Comprehending what Vera just said to you. You even see Robert's eyes widen. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, he, even Robert and his he's been with you now for almost a year, probably. Maybe a little maybe a little less or a little longer. Even he knows. <laughs> Wait a minute. What? So congratulations, Sean. You have been deeded something. Which means now not only are you basically our inheritee, you've become potentially my number one enemy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you really want me to bump you off, do you? I would wake in glee at the idea of you attempting to bump me off. Is Sean just that? I don't know what's going on. Yeah, I, yeah, it's, 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 Sean it's, just kind of like <laughs> let that linger. <laughs> as, it, as it becomes clear, maybe to Vera that Sean, it hasn't. It's like not really sinking in. Maybe even before you're about to say something, you're interrupted by a tall and lean gentleman with who walks with surprising gracefulness. Uh, who seems, uh, who, but still has like a slight hunch uh, to his walk. His posture isn't great. His hair is dark and completely swept back, and his eyes are an ice blue in his, uh, against his olive-toned skin. His age is surprisingly hard to pinpoint, however. He's uh, impeccable, uh, almost, is it, his uniform rather is impeccable with a crisp white shirt, dark pressed trouser, trousers, gold buttoned vest, and his hands are always gloved. You see white gloves against his hands. And as he walks up uh, to Vera, he bows his head very gently and he speaks with a very soft uh, uh, kind of uh, demeanor to him. Uh, Madam Vera, I presume. Yes, though I imagine I'll see more of you. So you can call me just Vera. I'll do my best to throw the formalities off that I am so accustomed to. But for now, if you wouldn't mind, it is more comfortable for me to address you as miss. And then he looks to... Sean and Robert, and you too as Mr. 
Does Vera say anything? Is she fine with that? I mean, who am I to tell? Like, if he seems most, he clearly has a purpose, and I'm not going to like break his programming. You know what I mean? Vera, you're the only one that's no. All three of you, can you give me a wits a wits awareness, please? Um, Vera got it to you. Two. I'm very witty and I'm very aware. Uh, you are you messy critted, but that's not a huge deal. Uh, the messiness doesn't really fall into this. What I'm looking for. You're the only one that can pick up off of him as he approached the group. You can smell a lingering, subtle scent of Vitae blood that kind of comes off of him. It's without your kindred senses, you're certain you would not be able to smell it. Vera and Sean just don't. It is just very, very subtle. As you as all three of you roll two successes, though, as you observe him, he is breathing. He looks not pale. Uh, if you were to guess, he's he's definitely not a full kindred, at least. That's pretty obvious to all three of you. I could do sense the beast, although I am not suspicious. I was about to say, neither is Vera. I, Vera assumes he's a ghoul. Until she has, you know, it, it makes sense. She, she she assumes he's a ghoul, considering the fact she asked for specifically someone who was aware of our circumstances. As he approaches you and he bows his head, he goes, my name is Virgil, ma'am. Virgil. Well, Virgil, um, we'd like to see where we'll be sleeping. He gestures for you three to immediately follow him, and he begin, uh, gives you a discreet little nod, and he begins to lead you down one of the hallways nearby, a uh, carpeted, obviously, hallway. And I imagine there's no hesitation. The three of you follow, and you walk away from the gleaming lobby towards a staircase in the way back. The, carpet, the carpets here are a deeper shade of red than the ones you were just walking on, uh, as if it was designed to like absorb light rather than reflect it. And the bellhop opens a heavy oaken door and gestures you into a nearby area. Guest rooms, lower levels, he uh, says in kind of a hushed tone. Quietest the entire establishment, I assure you. If this is where we're supposed to be, um, I, 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 I move forward. He leads. He doesn't want to, like, he's not going to, like, wait for you to and then shut the door behind you. He just wants to let you know, like, what's down. He'll lead you down uh, past the door. And as you pass the door, you realize you immediately enter to a spiral staircase dim lighting casting long shadows with each step as you progressively go down at a a slower pace you feel the air as you make your way down become notably cooler Uh, a kind of a a, a rather uh, obvious change from the warmth in the closer atmosphere of upstairs and when you eventually reach the bottom of the stairway you see a heavy iron bound door that is set into a thick stone wall the bellhop Mm. steps aside uh, almost like with a practiced deference and as one of you, uh, as he gestures for, uh, as he gestures for Vera to step forward, he, he reaches into his pocket and he pr- uh, produces to you in the palm of his hand a peculiar looking key, not brass like most other ones, but a cold, darkened metal that seems like to be almost swallow the light. Mm. Vera says, mm, how macabre. And I take it from him and I slot it in the door. The, the door click claw, uh, clicks open with a heavy, uh, you can hear the heavy lock kind of moving. And as the door creaks open ever so gently, beyond the threshold is not a hotel corridor, but a passage lined with thick stone. The air is tinged with an earthy coolness, and to either side, you actually can see heavy velvet curtains, rich in color, set into arched alcoves. You can see that the history down here is much, much deeper than the hotel itself. And, uh, he then you hear the bellhop kind of break the silence. Your accommodations, ma'am. Thank you. He pulls back the curtain and your eyes adjust to the dimness. This isn't a room, but a lavish niche. Heavy drapes partition it from the passageway, offering perfect darkness. The floor is stone and you see in one corner the luxurious velvet upholstery of a coffin built into the wall itself. A low stone table holds a, holds a pitcher of an unidentifiable dark liquid and a silver goblet. On the wall, a landscape painting. But the figure within the frame seems to flicker at the edge of your vision, almost as though you can't quite focus on whoever this painting holds. And the air, as I said down here, has got thick, not with age, but almost of anticipation. As you uh, run your fingers across the coffin's plush interior or take a look at the room itself, you know one thing. This is not just a place to see this to sleep. This is the foundation of your new domain. New blood room. <sighs> it is absolutely the blood room 
cranked up to 11, yes. <laughs> you are correct. I'd say we've come a long way since the blood wound, Sean. I'll say. Don't worry, Robert, you're not missing much. By blood room, we mean a maintenance closet in which we cleared everything out, hung a light bulb from the ceiling, and made sure that the blood drained straight into the sewers through the floor. Sounds charming. Yes, it was purposeful. Practical, yeah. Hmm. I bet you've never seen anywhere half as fancy as this, Rob. (laughs) Sean, (laughs) I'm just going to pretend you're not here. This vitae on the table, because... uh, Vera has not forgotten in her feralness, uh, as Sean continues to rake under her skin, uh, that uh, she's extremely hungry. That's right. You're at four, aren't you? I am you? at four hunger and have been all night. I did the walkthrough, kept my cool. Now I'm picking up the two of them, and I'm really trying to keep my cool. But you said there's a pitcher on the table. Yep, pitcher with it. Like, it's hard to tell what liquid is in it from where you're at, but if you walk up, you can uh, clearly tell it is Vitae, which means I need you to roll a hunger frenzy check because you see it. I forgot you were at four hunger, honestly. <laughs> I know. When you said it, I was like, I have to tell him. I have to be a good player. Yeah, I appreciate it very, very much. I would do the same. No, oh, I did it. Oh, I did it. Um, I still... Um, you drink? Yes, absolutely. All of it. Probably from the pitcher. Oh, sure. You grab the pitcher and bring the pitcher to your lips. Yeah, you probably watch Vera uh, just dr- like drink straight from the pitcher as much as her body will hold. The first thing you notice that's interesting as the uh, thick crimson vitae touches your lips first before passing into your mouth is how warm mm. the blood actually is being held in this pitcher. There's no way. Even if, if it was had been drained five seconds ago, it would be as warm as it is here. Moreover, perhaps the thing that even overtakes that notice of yours is the taste of red wine. Mm. The blood itself is mostly, it mostly tastes like vitae. But there is a, not in the blood as though they were drinking alcohol, but the blood right. itself has a gentle taste of red wine. Ah, it was drained from someone. Mm, I'll drink uh, just like a bond mm. uh, from this pitcher. And when I'm done, I'll gingerly like wipe the corners of my mouth and set down what's left. And I will say, no one is to tell Lyle. Um, he believes that I only drink from him. Understood. He's a special boy. Got it. So he is to believe. Uh, would the two of you like some? Uh, and I grab the cups as if I were to pour them politely. Of course. Yeah, yeah, let's have a toast. It is flush with red wine. Uh, as you say that, Virgil actually uh, steps in. Um, a correction, if you don't mind, madam. It is not from somebody who drank uh, the pitcher and the goblet itself. Through means I don't understand. Uh, maintain a temperature of the blood and give it a Taste reminiscent of, I'm told. Who is our supplier? I am not privy to that information, but I'm sure the Castellan knows. Wonderful. Do you take requests? He nods. Make a list for her. He reaches into a, a front pocket of his vest and pulls out a small little notepad and a, pe- and a pencil. I'd like a cumulative history of the hotel, its past owners, the artifacts that lie within it. He's jotting it all down and just nodding historical information that she might feel relevant to our cause. And I'd like to know anyone we do business with. Uh, thorough files, please, and they are to be passed to Duke. Nods, and as he finishes writing that down... Who deals the drugs for this hotel? He looks to you with a little confusion. It's me, looks like. Well, it's going to be. Do we currently have a system in which we run drugs for mortals? He shakes his head. No, the previous owner was not involved in such things. What were they involved in? Uh, hmm, property, uh, realty. They kept a lot of their business to themselves, and I am simply a bellhop, madam. Ah. Well, you have proven more than that this evening. He's, he smiles with um, pride, and, and, and when you say that to him, he actually, his, he doesn't undo his slouch, but his slouch lessens a little bit. Uh, and he, he actually continues, these quarters are for the owner and any guests they wish to have. However, there is a floor dedicated to your kind should they need a place to stay and you want to offer it. The 13th floor. The 13th floor. Thank you. We will probably have special clientele. That's all. I imagine we can wander our way back through the tunnels like rats that we are. Good night. Good night, madam. And Virgil turns and leaves with uh, pocketing the list you just he just jotted down. As soon as the two doors close, I look at the both of them and I said, something is wrong. Can you feel it? It's a little spooky. 
Correct. What makes you say that, Sean? Uh, well, it smells like dirt down here, and I don't know any of the people we've been spending uh, our time talking to. But it's there's, but it's Chicago. We don't, we don't know. Ah, Rob, you know Chicago. Is this weird for Chicago? I mean, Chicago is like any large city. There's weird things everywhere. The minute you think you know something, and turn the corner, and there's something new. I, I don't mean the smell of dirt, Sean, or the weird feelings you're getting in your belly. I mean, it's all too good. Mm, I don't know. Depends on who the last person that owned this was. Like, if they really messed up. That's what I mean. Oh. Uh. I have an idea. Shall we order some fresh clothes, look our best, and take a little trip to the Ivory Tower? I, I don't see why not. Uh, we, we've got, like, some f- proper fancy blood, though. Should we do a toast? Oh, yes, I guess I should pour myself a glass. Uh, what are we toasting to, Sean? This is your territory. D- uh, uh, to a dark future in Chicago. I will cheers to that, Sean. With a clink of the goblets, you all sip. And just like for, I described to Vera, Sean, and Robert, the warmth. Of the blo- of the of vitae is almost as though it's directly from the veins of someone, and it has that light lingering taste of red wine. But it is not alcoholic. You don't get tipsy off this. You can drink as much as you want, and you'll never get drunk. It's not actually alcoholic in any way. Hmm. How much do I actually manage to feed Mathis? Uh, the whole if the, so the cu- each cup can do one point, and I was gonna have uh, the pitcher have two in it, so. If you drank all two from the pitcher, then be none left for everybody else. So you could like do one. I would say everybody, if you want to share, I'll say everybody can have one. Is there any interest in checking out the 13th floor? Do you like, uh, do you want to look at any of the other uh, parts of the hotel at all? Yes. Let us check out the 13th floor. <laughs> Robert's like, I want to go check out the 13th floor. Most hotels don't even have 13th floors anymore. That's right. It goes from 12 to 14. I want to talk about this clientele as we, we walk. And I'll kind of tell him that as we wander our way back and elevator and all of that. Yep. There's kind of, uh, she says, well, what do you notice about the hotel? We walked through the lobby. A distinct lack of swans. <laughs> yes, tell me of these swans that you... They were tacky and I hated them. At least I have some taste. Whoever this real estate agent was that dealt with everything before seems to be lacking on... Uh, I don't know. Class? Everything is pretty... Pristine. Probably found them on Zillow.com or something. Precisely. He probably. Not that this is an ad for that. It's not. I'm just saying <laughs> we can do better than swans, so the gargoyles can stay. Ooh. As you uh, reach the elevators after in the main lobby, you actually notice there is no 13th floor button. There are stairs, though. You can go to the 12th floor and take the stairs to the 13th. You don't have to, like, walk from floor 1 to 13. Oh, I see what you're saying. It only has direct floor access. The <sighs> stairs. I had a panic moment because I'm stealing my shoes. Okay, um, oh, so no. I guess <laughs> we go to 12 and we walk up. Yeah. Uh, as you, the doors roll up. Oh, sorry, continue your conversation. If there are any more conversations. I didn't you know, mean to we just wait on the elevator and Beer says, what I'm saying is there was a distinctive lack of people and kindred alike. It's dead. No business. What's the point in owning a place if you're not actually going to use it to monopolize on all its many opportunities, such as the FedEx Kinko, for example? Are what we trying to serve businessmen who need to make copies for their meetings, or are we trying to serve businessmen who want to take the evening off from their jobs and not tell their wives? Either way, FedEx Kinko seems to be some sort of hotel requirement these days. Not on our block. We'll offer them something different. If they want to copy their papers, they can go to some other cheesy hotel. If they want to come here after hours to assure that they get the fill of their vices, under great security, little scrutiny. All I'm saying is that if we keep the FedEx Kinkos, it won't arouse suspicion. I have it's a beard, if, as if you would, you know? I have plans for the FedEx Kinkos, Robert. Fine. Something I would like your help with as well. Both of you. Did you, you say that? The oh. door, the elevator dings and it oh. opens as people file out, but you'll be the only ones to enter the uh, elevator. People file out holding their FedEx Kinkos bags in hand. As soon as the door closes and I go back to my, my private conversation, I say, look, I have 
plans for the FedEx Kinkos and not for me. Vera, we could use the employees. We could put them to work for us. Think of the possibilities. All the copies. Robert, I'm saving it for Duke. It's a gift. A business. Fine. My dream of owning FedEx Kinko's franchises across the country will have to wait. Um, maybe we could talk about putting one on something that's not the lobby floor. All right. I'm, I'm one for compromise. But, but listen, I have... You should hear this. And I'll even hold the elevate button on, on floor 12 if I have to. And I said, listen... Duke is, did, all of this for us. Years. Literally like two years of work to get this hotel. He, he, he assured that our most prized possessions would be taken care of. The things that we want. Uh, opportunities that lie here. Even worked you into that, Robert. And he did absolutely, incredibly well. It's true. But the one thing Duke did not do is write himself into any of it. It's quite selfless. It is. And also worrisome. Mm. Duke seeks a constant need to answer questions. When he's figured out and solidified everything here, what's keeping him? And I thought, what if we bring those enigmas to him? If we're going to serve Kindred, I thought we'd serve them in a way that actually is maybe outside the Camarilla. I whisper very quietly on this elevator. We all know that in our most desperate times, it is always us that solves the problem in New York and Gary. I think Duke should open a detective agency of some kind, private, solving the kindred world's problems, one question at a time, making us vital to this city and to those who find themselves questioning whether or not the Camarilla has their back. I really like that. I think that's a great idea. So, we can keep the FedEx Kinkos, but we're going to move it to a different floor because it is an eyesore in that lobby. Okay, what? I've seen many of them on the second floor, on the <laughs> mezzanine level or what have you. And, and, and Sean, I see you're, you're bursting at the seams. Uh, please. No, the, the, the masquerade is man- maintained with the FedEx Kinkos. That's incredibly important. Nice one, Rob. I have an idea for Duke's uh, little agency. Oh. I'll see if I can get the stuff together. I might even ask Mia to give me a hand. But he needs a space to practice magic. Yes, about that. He does. He seems rather enamored with that new enigma. Um, so if you could help him out, because I'm going to be honest, it is not um, within my skill set. Mm. Well, I've, I've learned some new stuff. Me is probably a better teacher. Before you do new things, let's make sure he can walk, if you know what I mean, Tron. Well, he's not going to explode. And not himself. Other people will. He's not. Minimal risk, Sean. Let's start with minimal, minimal risk. We just got to the hotel, okay? That's uh, dull, but fine. Great. I un- let, let off the, the hold button on the elevator. And the doors roll open. Then you step onto the 12th floor and make your way to the stairs. As you pro- uh, stride up to the 13th floor... Here, <clears throat> you actually see, at least when you step into the hotel, while the re- uh, under the floor, rather, while the rest of the establishment can take caters to uh, the luxury seeking mortal clientele, this floor has been subtly but purposefully adapted to its more um, undying residents. As you step out into the floor, you actually see on the left hand side, one of the doors is actually uh, cracked open um, as uh, there's like a cleaning one of those cleaning rollers on the outside. And you can actually take a peek in his note. You clearly see no evidence of anybody, anybody using this room. But if you have curiosity to see what these rooms look like, does anybody step in? Mm-hmm. You might as well. It's our hotel. Yep. Yes, absolutely. What you see is a normal layout for a hotel with, again, small differences. Obviously, the windows are completely sunblocked and sunproof. You see, obviously, uh, the heavy drapes that are just like sunproof blinds. And even behind that, the windows themselves of this floor have been uh, tinted and made to withhold and and reflect sunlight out and not let it in at all. Um, Can I get a wits awareness from uh, everybody? While you roll that, you notice that each room, uh, or at least this room, and you imagine each room has a luxurious king-sized coffin bed. And the difference is important. While there is a, while you have a normal bed, should there be an emergency with fl- uh, sunlight pouring in, you're fucked in a normal bed. But if you have a coffin bed, 
you can you close it and you're it's sunproof it's not like a wooden coffin it's a sunproof modern coffin that is there to be pulled shut whether you want it for an extra layer layer of safety uh or not you also uh notice and let me look at your rolls real quick i got a three uh jason and dot did uh fine sean did not you you would notice as well the set there's a um, a little bit of soundproofing the walls are a little bit more uh, thick a little more dampening than the other areas for a little bit l- level extra of privacy the hotel management on this floor and you would actually see like i guess it would be like a piece of paper or something that kind of gives amenities that are offered uh to those on this floor um but there are discreet and trustworthy ghouls for the most part that can be contacted through a prearranged system that's on this with through the phone like a hidden button uh, under first the desk lamp that you can use that acquires uh, to acquire for a blood for a price. This ensures that the kindred has access to safe and reliable source of sustenance. So there is it costs it or at least it used to, but there is a button under the lamp that you feel. And uh, when you press, a, you would uh, see the piece of paper. You would have probably been informed about it rather that it calls in a trustworthy ghoul to feed from for the people who are staying in this hotel. I'm telling you. The FedEx Kinko's employees could all be ghouls. I've got an idea for that, actually. I can see it happening. While the rest of the hotel has that kind of, like, opulence, it's still rather opulent on this floor, too, but it's got a bit more of a gothic tinge to it. You're looking at deep, rich, rich colors on the walls, burgundy, em- emerald green, or even, like, a tasteful black. It's different from room to room. Artwork with a touch of the macabre. Uh, landscapes with a haunted aura, portraits with shadowy eyes, you know, weirder, more darker themed things here. Um, and then subtle nods to things like of the supernatural, like ornate lamps shaped like a raven, throw pillar, pillows embroidered with ancient symbols that you even, you know, with your basic understanding of blood magic isn't anything like this isn't actually a blood rune or anything. Um, and the like antique mir- mirrors and the like is uh, kind of how this is all laid out. All aesthetic, no practicality. Yes, well, when have Kindred been practical? Well, when we invented the blood room. Ah, yes, some things are out of necessity, Sean, necessity. Maybe uh, happy with what you see, and you step out back into the room. Vera, with just the three, and you're the only one that gets the three, as you may be striding down the rest of the hallway, seeing what's left, on a room to your right, that's number, just like a typical normal room, you actually hear muffled conversation. Enough to pick up some words. Maybe as you stroll closer, you get to hear a little clearer. And you're certain you hear somebody on the other side say, I'm going to stake that bitch, I swear to fucking God. I'll just use heightened senses. Is it, uh, heightened senses is free, right? Or is it a... Uh... It is. So yeah, you hear you hear that very clearly um, in a, a lower tone, not like they're shouting it, but in a hushed kind of like lower tone. I'm going to stake that fucking bitch, I'm telling you right now. And then you hear uh, somebody reply to them. Listen, I know... She did you fucking dirty, man. But you gotta just take it slow, patient. You have all the time in the world, literally. I don't give a fuck how much time I have. She's got this coming to her. I will knock. As you knock, you hear all of a sudden conversation stops. Do you uh, reach for the door handle? I don't. Uh, I knock and I say, um, uh, "Hospitality services. Just the owner checking in to make sure you've had a five star experience." You hear no response. Remember, if you don't want to be bothered, you ought to leave the little hanger on the door. And I'll kind of run my fingernails, the the silver ends kind of down the door, so you get that little bit of a of a screech. No response. Dead silence. And then I'll walk on. Does do you there one of you? <laughs> Sean's a little bit more mischievous. Uh, uh yeah, sure. <laughs> Sean just drives by and he gently runs his fingertips across it, pushes some weight on it, and it pop, pops open. Sean, you can't just walk into someone's room. It's rude. Sean, what's awareness? Oh. <clears throat> you, only, you, didn't, you didn't swing it wide open. I imagine you just kind of touched it to see if it was unlocked and like creaked it open a tiny bit. One. Do I get shot in the face? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, no. One is I literally just need a success out of you as because you're right at the door. As the door creaks open, you feel a little bit of that wind seep through. You actually notice there's nobody in there. Uh, as you look into the room further, the bed is perfectly made. There is no evidence of anyone av- having been here at all. No suitcases, no clothes, no nothing. The door, the window is, these windows are bolted like they cannot be opened because they're sunproofed. There's nobody in here. Interesting. I'll kind of push Sean to the side and step into the room. <laughs> as, as, as Sean like opens it because Vera walked away, he's like, 
Hello? And you just hear Vera, interesting as she literally gently moves you out of the way. Vera will kind of run her hand down the, the perfectly made bed and kind of around the space. She'll just reach up and bite her finger for a little bit of pain, and she's going to rouse for a premonition. I may regret this. Okay. Premonition? Yes, I guess we'll see. Yeah, um, I will rouse, yeah, because it is free or rouse, but I'll rouse for it to make it better. Well, right? it's what? free if I instigate it, but if you want to if you want to oh, trigger I one, see. you have to roll. Yeah, yeah. But it can be if it's if I'm like, oh, you get a vision in this moment. You only roll one success, but that doesn't mean you fail. As you walk over to it and you uh, run, do you run uh, blood across it from your finger that you bit? Yeah, just my hand kind of runs and there's probably a small streak left behind. Um, There is an instant response, one that causes you to recoil uh, your hand immediately. As you run your hand across the mirror, a cacophony of whispers so loud it would deafen any mortal. Ab- uh, uh, just completely overwhelms you. The other two hear nothing. Right. Just you. You could not make out any of the words, but just hundreds of voices all whispering different things all at once. You see Vera actually pull back, which doesn't usually happen. She she flinches at nothing. Um, and you see her kind of flinch as she pulls her hand back from the mirror. Uh, you're, you're okay? Something is strange here. Hmm. N- not just here, in the hotel. Rob, can you see invisible people? Uh, as far as I know, I cannot see invisible people. <clears throat> um, I don't think they're invisible, Sean. Mm, I've had too much of that recently. <sighs> Building this all doesn't make an imprint on history without people making an imprint on it. Uh, when is a gift not a gift? Never. A gift is never a gift. There's always a catch. Correct. Plus, I wouldn't consider this a gift. We earned it rightfully. Paid where we need to pay it and signed the dotted line. I'd call it a business deal. And if Jackson thinks that a little spookiness is going to scare Vera Volkov out of this diamond gym, then he is wrong. So very wrong. Perhaps it is a test. It seems that he does like to test people. Indeed. I wonder how he felt we did in the one in Gary. Did he tell you, Robert, have any feelings about the outcome? He simply said <clears throat> he knows that Gary was taken care of. Uh, the, it seems like he didn't have the full on details of what had happened by the time he's spoken with them. Um, but he welcomed you. He appreciated you announcing yourself into Chicago and he welcomed you back into Chicago. Um, and uh, he took the, the Malkavian from you. How's about it? It seemed everything seemed to be very normal. Sean, I suggest as you and Duke dive deeper into a little bit of blood magic, you be very careful. This seems to be maybe a hot spot of activity. You never know what you'll unearth or release. What what do you two normally do about random voices you hear coming out of nowhere? Asking for a friend. I think Vera says, Sean, are you having premonitions? Sure. Whatever whatever this was, if that was a premonition. Vera, you've spoken to Duke about it. When did you gain access to those abilities? No, I I don't I don't have access to those abilities. So you're telling me you're not having premonitions and you're hearing voices. You heard them too. I I heard many voices, Sean. Tied to moments of the past. You did not, did you? Fuck. No. Whose voice did you hear, Jean? Others. There is. Not a te- not an awkward, but a tense silence that follows that immediately. Time for you to see some of our dirty laundry, Robert. <sighs> well, as long as I can hold my nose. And I don't mean Sean's. There's a reason we aren't allowed to stay in New York. Due to the actions of a few specific kindred who... Attempted to incite some form of governmental breakdown of the Camarilla. Sean was looped into a cult, weren't you, Sean? Yeah, that's one way. You ever had you ever dealt with the Sabbat? Rob- <clears throat> oh. Uh Robert, absolutely. Uh they were a problem back when you were embraced before, and uh, for you, Jason, if you don't know what Sabbat are, they are basically kindred who don't think uh, the only thing that should happen is they should rule over humans old school they are hunting down yeah i remember yeah, okay, cool, cool, cool. yeah, yeah. Uh, the old, they were on in the old editions right right yeah yes 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 100 percent. they're um yeah they're basically just basically the same gentle sean i guess 
you could say, in our little soap opera of a life, I had some bad choices in men made necessary by deals brokered. Hmm. I convinced him that I was in love with him. Really? I thought he died in the Battle of New York, and he did not. He came back to enact loverly revenge upon myself and my family, with Sean as the sticking point. And our dear Sean here learned a little something about Diablery at the end. I was not always this jacked. Yeah, uh, you know what Diablery is, of course. Um, Robert, uh, the, the big thing with Diablery is, like, because you're imbibing the soul of another kindred... There are stories you've probably maybe even maybe even you've seen it a couple times. One Diablo is super frowned upon, um, but when it does happen, sometimes the person who was uh, Diablerized can take over the body of the other person and like become them, and the other person ceases to exist. Sometimes, even if the other person wins, like if Sean won, they hear or like the part of the person the Diablerized is almost like an echo uh, of a different personality in the back of their mind. So him talking to the person he may he diablerized is abnormal but not unheard of. All right. So Sean, tell me, what is father saying to you? Uh you hear in your head, Sean. You really gonna tell her? Just the normal stuff about what he used to say, you know. I don't. You spend a lot of time with him. I'm sure. Because I spent a lot of time with him before he called himself father and decided that a cult was the best way to rid the world of kind. Hmm. Well, he's just very interested in me doing well. It's a bit creepy. Mathis. You can wits insight this. Yeah. Um, I'm going to wits insight it. I'll just have to do a flat. But. Um, um, if you want to, uh, I will set a difficulty, Josh, or. You can roll a manipulation subterfuge, your call. I rolled a bestial failure. I'm getting a little fed up here. Uh, I don't like father. Um, no, uh, you, you, you completely, he seems like he's actually being, this is again, you did put Sean to the will of the, of the hotel. There's a trust level there and he seems to be being genuine. I trust that you would be honest with me, Sean, if something were wrong. But when I tell you that decades ago, I purposefully attempted to kill him. I expected it would have to be the only time. Then there was a second time, and I believed we had rid ourselves, me and my family, of father, and now you're carrying him around, and I've heard that the third time is a charm. So please, let's make sure father stays inside that little head of yours, hmm? It's just an echo. It's getting on my nerves. But it's just an echo. Another room you may have wandered into. uh, There's a couple of rooms on this floor that are highly, highly VIP. Um, There's a not too many differences, but you note one of them. uh, They the high the VIP rooms have an emergency uh, sunlight reactor. Not like a power reactor, but like if sunlight somehow came in, uh, the coffin uh, the coffin door auto shuts. Sure, yeah. For a higher price, you can kind of pay for that stuff, but. As you finish saying that to Sean, probably in one of the rooms to make sure nobody's on the, in the hallway can fucking hear you in case there is other people in the uh, other rooms. You step out into the hallway prep to leave. But as you do, you step out into an unfamiliar hallway with unfamiliar doors. Shall we say a state of disrepair that is not what you first stepped into. And on that, we'll return next week. Bye, everybody. <laughs>